Okay, my name's Jo Lofthouse, and I'm the International Programme Coordinator for the Africa Climate Change Resilience Alliance, which I think uh, most of you will have heard of or picked up some materials by now. Uh, I'm going to give uh, a fairly brief presentation on, on, the, on the key um, focus of this session. So, how do livelihoods, DRR, and social protection programs contribute to adaptive capacity in Africa? This is the very preliminary findings from two sites that we're doing our research in. We're doing research in 11 sites in total. So do keep an eye on our website. I'll show it to you at the end so that you can um, see the reports as they emerge. You've already heard who we are and who's involved, and this is where we work, Ethiopia, Uganda, and Mozambique. And what I'm going to talk about is just briefly, why are these concepts important? So why are... Um, why are they linked to adaptation? Then also a brief outline of the research questions. So what are the five characteristics as well of adaptive capacity, just so that you're aware of, of the format. I'm not going to go into methodology. You'll be relieved to hear, because that will take a long time to do. Um, what's currently happening in existing projects that's helping to increase adaptive capacity? And what's missing? So it's a fairly uh, simple outline. This is a slightly less simple slide, and don't worry, it will be sent round. Uh, but the aim is just to illustrate that all these different interventions can contribute to adaptive capacity. Um, and I think what we're finding sometimes is there's some relabeling going on of existing programs to say that they are climate change adaptation programs. And what we're trying to do in Accra is work out whether that is the case. So on DRR programs, uh, you might have drought-resistant crops, you might have early warning systems. All of these could not only reduce vulnerability, but could potentially increase people's adaptive capacity to climate change. Similarly, with social protection, uh, the promotion of a minimum wage, cash transfers, in theory, these could keep, give people more space to innovate. They could give them more space to try new things and adapt. But you know, we're not sure whether that's the case or not yet. Um, so those are some examples. Livelihoods diversification enables people to spread risk. So um, it's just a very briefly touching on that so you understand sort of where we're coming from and where Accra is coming from at this point. So all our research is on existing programs by our members. This is just a slide to show you that it is participatory research that we're doing and it's qualitative. Um, and we've already gone through the key questions that we're looking to, to answer. I'm going to very briefly touch on our characteristics of adaptive capacity. For those who want more detail, um, I know some of you have the paper already, and you can look on our website. Uh, we've worked to characterize adaptive capacity to frame our research to help us actually try to analyze this uh, very intangible thing. So the asset base is really your classic livelihoods uh, approach. So it's looking at your different human, financial, physical capital, etc. Flexible and forward-thinking decision-making and governance. So that's really how flexible is government? How much is government able to respond to change? And I think that's a really challenging area for, for all governments in developed and developing countries when it comes to climate change. Institutions and entitlements, there we're talking about the rules of the game. So we're talking about power, which has come up a lot. So who has access to different assets? Uh, what are the formal and informal rules and policies that are in place? Knowledge and information, there was a session on that yesterday, so how easily, how readily do people have access to information, how is it used, um, do they have the information they need, or is information flowing upwards? And innovation, now this one's really tricky, but do people have the space to try new things, because that's absolutely critical when you're talking about adaptation, you know, can people experiment? And I think we're finding that that's the area that's most difficult uh, for us to sort of support and encourage. The two sites I'm going to talk about now are um, pastoralist sites in uh, Uganda and Ethiopia. I'm focusing on those two sites because obviously I don't have time to talk about all 11, so um, I'm sure that's, that's a relief to you all. Um, pastoralism, I'm probably uh, telling you something you already know, but for those who don't, you know, this is about quite a mobile lifestyle, pastoralist lifestyles. Uh, they have very different service provision needs, and so this has often resulted in marginalization uh, or some kind of neglect because it's very difficult to um, provide services to them. But historically, they have been more adapted to dry land conditions. So some people believe that they do have a more adaptive lifestyle, and that's one of the things that we'll be looking at in our research. 
Um, there's often a lot of conflict with landowners because they're based on communal land use systems. So, so you do see a lot of conflict around land and that can increase the marginalization. Uh, many governments are focusing on moving them away from pastoralism to agro-pastoralism. So they want them to be more sedentary, stop moving around so much. Given the areas they're in, that's very, very challenging when you look at drought and climate change. And we're really seeing that in our research. Um, range and degradation is a problem for a number of region, reasons in, in some communities. So very, very briefly, uh, here's just a summary of the two sites. One is uh, a program in Oxfam, an Oxfam program in Karamoja, a livelihoods program. Um, the key challenges that they're facing are drought, disease, and some flash floods. Uh, between uh, 2007 uh, and 2009, they had some very serious uh, droughts in Karamoja. And again, this year, there's been a very long dry spell. Um, so they're really seeing uh, a, an increase in this uh, frequency of drought and they're really struggling with that. And this increased move towards agro-pastoralism doesn't really fit with that. Um, the aim of the project is to ensure that the men and women have a secure and sustainable life um, and are able to influence those with power over them, which is critical. We've talked a lot about power. So you have some alternative livelihoods, cash for work, food security work, water harvesting, livestock management and drought resistant crops. So some of your you know, fairly classic livelihoods work. Then Save the Children in, in Shifra in Ethiopia is the second site I'm going to talk about. I'm going to merge the results uh, together because of, of time, but again, you'll be able to go on our website and look at the reports as they come out. This is the Protective Safety Net program as part of the program. I think many of you may have heard of it, but if you haven't, it's worth a look. It's a really massive um, social protection program in Ethiopia with uh, government and all development partners involved. So that involves cash and food transfers and public works to build community assets such as roads, etc. Then there's also a DRR element, which is about early warning systems, livestock health and nat natural resource management. Then lastly, some income diversification. So there they're working with pastoralists and agro-pastoralists. It's a very brief summary. I'm giving you a rapid romp through this, so bear with me. But uh, I hope that gives you an idea of those, those programs. So now to the findings. Looking at the asset base, I'm going to do this by the five characteristics that we discussed, because that's how we did our analysis. And our analysis was based on a month spent with each community. So it's quite in-depth, uh, very participatory research. Um, so looking at the asset base, well, of course we found that some assets, some vital assets were promoted and protected. And I think, you know, that goes without saying. So you're looking at clean water, more crop varieties, gave people more capacity to um, grow crops during drought. You know, they had access to livestock extension services for the first time, so that reduced the cattle diseases. Um, the access roads were, were a huge bonus because they improved the access to markets. That was in Uganda. Um, and again, safety net food, you know, that reduces asset loss to some extent. And it, 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 it means people don't have to necessarily sell their assets as quickly during a drought period. So you can see that some of the assets were built up, and that's to be expected. Um, I think some of the issues that we found, what was missing that could have been improved in these interventions, that there's a real focus on your sort of traditional assets such as land, water and crops, but there wasn't always a uh, recognition that they needed to be climate appropriate. So you might get promotion of cash crops with no access to markets. And obviously that's something that can't work. And that links into obviously adaptive capacity because access to markets is key uh, to building up assets. Um, similarly, you might have slow maturing seeds being uh, promoted in an area where there was a very short rainy season. So again, it's just not appropriate to the climate. And this is something that we found across the programs, and that's just a reflection of this new challenge um, and the fact that the weather has become so variable, particularly in the last 10 years in these areas that we're looking at. Um, we found that in social protection, the transfers prevent asset loss, but not enough to actually enable people to build assets. So it's really, I wouldn't say it's helping people to adapt, it's helping people to just cope. Um, also some issues around transfers to men in, in town, so not to women, uh, so were the assets that they receive being used in the best possible way. I think one of the key areas around the asset base was there was a lack of ambition to scale up. So there was always this focus on community, and this came out 
with every characteristic. So were we looking to you know, work with government enough, work with the private sector and scale up the work we were doing to have a long-term impact? And I think a lot of the time the answer we found was no. And I think that's something that's coming out in this conference. And then also, can we prioritize the most transformative combination of interventions? So really looking at the whole package, what is going to really push people forward? You know, we often found that the activities were a little bit um, disparate and didn't, didn't cohesively pull together as one. How long have I got? Oh, okay. Okay, so I have to be quick on this one. Um, so, so have I? Sorry, I'm just checking how many minutes I've got. I wasn't sure what the yellow card meant exactly. Um, institutions and entitlements. So what we found was projects tend to focus more on your community level institutions. So women's groups to give access to grain, uh, local water management committees. And the issue with that is that you're not, you're not focusing enough on your government institutions. So we found that there was too much focus on the, on the local institutions, not enough linkages upwards. So for example, water management committees actually really needed to be linked up to the government uh, officer that was dealing with water in the district, but often weren't. So again, there's, there's no opportunity to really scale up that work. Um, where targeting was done through traditional institutions, that was very, very helpful because um, the ways of communicating uh, information um, and the way for example, in Ethiopia, um, working through the kind of equi they, the community had a very equitable asset distribution system, so working through that rather than developing a new one. But we did find that institutions' entitlements were basically the most neglected characteristics, um, and that you would need to link up more and pay more attention to power. Knowledge and information focused mainly on project information. Um, and that was useful, but didn't focus enough on the climate-related information where available. And also traditional systems, indigenous systems of projecting forecasts were not fed back up. That was also a big, a big issue. Um, so more climate information is needed, more information flowing upwards, and also not just the type of information, but what's the best way to communicate that? What are the systems already in place and how can we use them? Flexible forward-thinking decision-making and governance. Um, this was one of the areas that we found was the weakest in, in many of the projects we looked at. And again, these are preliminary findings, so we may find some that uh, go against that. But one thing we'd recommend is that people do undertake a gap analysis. It doesn't take that much time to do and understand where the government gaps are in responding to climate change and where your organization can best add value. And where it can't add value, bring someone else in who's got some money and time to do it. And without doing that, there's no opportunity to scale up any of the interventions that are effective. Innovation was an extremely challenging area. We really found it hard to work out what was new uh, and what was innovative. Um, we found that uh, project-driven innovations at times worked. Um, you know, at times people were very interested in them. We found really interesting things around the byproducts of project interventions. So roads in particular um, you know, gave people access to ma markets, really, really opened things up for them. And that was part of the Cash for Work program. Um, Women's groups that were formed then spontaneously went into petty trading, and that made a big difference. So these were things that were not driven by the project, but were a byproduct of the intervention. And I think it's worth trying to monitor that and understand that, uh, to understand whether you can build on those in a next phase of the project if you're staying there. Um, I'm going to just go to my last slide because I know I'm about to get a red card, uh, but do come up and talk to me some more if you want to. Um, just some key points from this, and I, you know, I wish I'd had more time to give more uh, in-depth information, but do come up to any of us and, and talk to us. Um, firstly, you need the right transformative combination of, of asset building. So you know, that sounds a bit jargony, but really looking at the package that you're putting together and working out, uh, you know, trying to work out whether there will be an uptake before doing it and what's the best combination. And we found that wasn't happening much. It means the assets aren't being built, uh, you know, sort of in a combination that will actually uh, enable people to adapt. More aspiration to scale up, you know, link to the government, link to the private sector. That's a real blind spot for, for you know, development workers in general. Um, but for example, I know Oxfam is trying to link up with uh, the private sector on coffee production in Uganda. 
Um, institutions and governance are just critical to scaling up. So, and also trying to harmonize the planning processes. You know, governments are complaining that they've got the UN doing an evaluation, they've got Oxfam doing an evaluation, they're doing their own vulnerability evaluation. It's too much. So how can you link into existing processes and budgets rather than sort of duplicating? Um, Access to mar markets is coming out as being critical to adaptive capacity because it provides just that extra uh, source, of, uh, source of income and, and where people have that access, they've said it's really uh, improved their, their asset base. Looking for the optimal process for, processes for information dissemination and not just what information but how. And lastly, is there anything to replicate on, on innovation that's already being done or that's happened as a byproduct of your program? Uh, so not just bringing something new like crafts in uh, where there might not be uh, uptake, but thinking about what might be most suitable. Lastly, on social protection, um, so far we found, although very useful for cash transfers are useful for coping, um, it hasn't really given the people the space to innovate because they're still at such a low level that they're not going to take risks with that scamp money. So um, I think at the moment we're finding that it's not really giving people that space. This is our website. Uh, please do note it down. Um, feel free to come up to me or we have some of the coordinators here or Eva. Um, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Joe, very much. Um, very good overview of what ACRA does, which is a highly complex project. Um, our next speaker is um, Sarah Wiggins from uh, Tier Fund. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you um, for this opportunity to speak. I feel it's a very big honor to be able to share at this conference. Um, so my name is Sarah Wiggins and I lead on climate change adaptation in Tier Fund um, in the policy team. Um, I'm based in the UK. Tier Fund is an international NGO um, and we've been working for quite a long time on climate change and environmental sustainability, particularly looking at the overlap between C uh, climate change adaptation disaster risk reduction, water, food security. And we've worked on that in our policy work and as well at program level. And for us, all our policy work is about justice. And I um, feel it's important to frame the presentation I'm giving uh, on integrated approaches to adaptation um, in, in that framework because it's all about getting the money that is rightfully due to the poorest and most vulnerable communities to them. And so, um, historically, developed countries are responsible for the increase in cl climate conditions, um, climate change that is affecting these local communities. And although the work here is focused at policy level, it's all about helping the communities in the end. And the report Adaptation United is looking at how sectors and ministries at a national level in developing countries can work together so that there are not fragmented responses and also so that multiple stakeholders can be involved in the process, so that the process can be more equitable and more sustainable. So climate change adaptation should not be another sector. All these issues and many more are joined up at the local level and require a holistic response. Tier Fund works, for instance, with a partner, Jemed, in the Sahel region of Niger, where there are many climate impacts. Um, and so Tier Funds or any other NGOs or donor response could be to work through its water sector and it could have programs like this. Or its sustainable livelihoods might look like this. Food security, disaster risk reduction people might do these projects and we might do these. But what are our partner responses? Well, we hope there will be integrated solutions. And actually, Jemed is doing 22 fixation sites where it's providing wells, dikes, schools, clinics, and pasture management. So what is integrated adaptation? It's a holistic approach which coordinates the interactions between different agency operations from the outset rather than optimizing them separately. 
we see this is different to mainstreaming because mainstreaming is good for integrating climate change into an individual sector or minister, um, ministerial work, but it doesn't necessarily ask the minist ministries or sectors to join together and provide a coordinated response. Um, I've been asked to give some case studies from the research we did on Adaptation United, so I will share one now about Nepal. And Nepal really is leading the way in providing some practical building blocks for how other governments can take action to work in multi-stakeholder um, and cross-sectoral ways. It produced an expanded NAPA, which was um, based on learning from all the other countries that did NAPAs. It was one of the last countries to produce, of the LDCs to produce a NAPA. And it has managed to achieve country ownership. So when I was in Nepal and I spoke to people from the government and from NGOs, they all said, this is our, our um, adaptation plan. And that there was a real sense that they wanted to see it happen. And also they have asked donors to sign a compact to align their work with this NAPA. So this is great. This is a building block that perhaps other countries have not tried to take intersectoral um, work into account, can, can pattern and can follow. And we, we provide in the report 11 building blocks for how countries can try and achieve cross-sectoral work. How did they do this? Briefly, they did it through, for instance, setting up thematic working groups on agriculture, climate disasters, water, forests, health and urban settlements. And then these guys um, took um, different stakeholders from government level to local level into the community and there was a real light bulb moment for people from the different ministries. So, say in the water ministry, the top government official suddenly realized that climate change really was relevant to them. And then they went and through participatory processes agreed their priorities, put them in the NAPA and um, and the NAPA is not just looking at the short term, it's expanded because it's um, also planning for the medium and longer term. Um, and now they sit together on a coordinating committee and work together. We've yet to see what will happen. This is the big question for Nepal, but it's a good start. Here are some more definitions, and people have mentioned these. So the horizontal is about the multiple um, sectors, and the vertical is about multiple stakeholders. And a really crucial thing for sustainability and equity is to involve civil society and communities in the national planning level, so that the decisions made at a national policy level will be lasting and will be sustainable. Um, I think I have another. Yeah, another case study, which is uh, here from Bangladesh. There are lots of really good building blocks in the government here in Bangladesh too. And as many of you will know, that they have set up a Bangladesh climate change strategy and action plan. And all elements of this plan are incorpor incorporated into their new five-year development plan. Um, and 14 ministries have worked on that plan and are helping to implement it through their climate change trust fund. Um, which is, has representatives from all the ministries on it. Again, um, although there are some really good things in place, we have yet to see the money reaching the communities, but these are all good lessons that we can build on. So what are the benefits of integration? Well, I just want to say here that I think they are significant. Um, they enable scaling up and cost effectiveness because they avoid the water sector doing one project and the agricultural sector doing a similar thing elsewhere and not sharing learning or duplicating their work or not sharing resources or even harming and stopping each other's work. Um, and also they lead, lead to greater equity and sustainability because of the involvement of all the stakeholders. Another example then from Honduras is that um, the Ministry for Environment and National Resources um, just in 10 months in 2010 has achieved an awful lot. And I think this can be an encouragement to us that, um, that through taking action and simple steps you really can achieve um, an integration. So they set up, have already set up um, an interagency committee and have undertaken countrywide consultation. And one quote that I really love is that for the first time ever, all the cabinet ministers from Honduras came and visited the Ministry of Environment and had a meeting. And so you can see the national level buy-in um, from across the ministries in that country. There are many challenges to integration. Um, and in Bolivia, they set up the National Program for Climate Change, which um, is a great idea, you know, to lead on adaptation. However, unfortunately, they faced rocky process. 
Um, they've had a change in government and turnover of staff and through lack of will or incentives, they haven't been able to fulfill the commitments they made. But we were told that attention seems to be shifting back to it, so we hope that um, good progress will be made soon. So the bulk of the recommendations in the report, Adaptation United, is 11 building blocks like these, and I, I've tried to touch on them. Um, so here there are a couple of extra ones about the communication around the science and climate variability and change. And I think this is so crucial, and we have mentioned that before, that um, until we have more of the science, really we are operating in the dark and we can't plan in a way that we know will be effective or sustainable. And, um, and I think the capacity of civil society being built is really crucial, and we need to do more than just kind of say, oh, well, NGOs can have 20% of our adaptation funds. We need to actually really engage with civil society to improve their capacity and provide mechanisms for them to genuinely be a part of the process. So who needs to take what type of action? Well, we all need to act. Um, Policy decision makers in developing countries are the key drivers and they need to provide the environment for integrated approaches to adaptation. I don't think they necessarily need to be the channel for all the funds and it would be great if some of the adaptation funding can go directly to a, a, a lower level and um, local governments and, and civil society. Um, but they do need to facilitate it. Um, developed countries and multilateral agencies need to find ways of encouraging greater country ownership and also aligning their programs with the country's own programs. I know that it's difficult, but um, we spoke to people in Nepal and the government official there, he said, you know, what are we to do? We have this fantastic NAPA and country ownership, but unless we, we are given money to use on it, we're just going to be trying to fit our programs into the donors' programs. And this is a long-lasting issue, I know, but this is an issue that's really important to integrated approaches. So, um, I don't think integrated approaches are a panacea, and they don't offer all the answers, but they are significant, and there are important gains, and they are a means to an end. And so, um, the end is justice for the communities that are most affected by climate change. Um, it's important not to have fragmented um, actions and it's important to include civil society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sara. Our next speaker is um, Puffa. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to be placed in a panel that is supposed to talk about you know, uh, African climate resilience and African problems, although I will take you to the you know, world of Himalayan disasters and Himalayan climate change and Himalayan adaptation, where uh, the challenges are floods, flash floods, water scarcity, drought, glacier lake outburst flood, landslide dam outburst flood, River bank erosion and sand casting and siltation. So, friends, here uh, I, I will share with you some experiences and learnings obtained from a research that was conducted on local adaptation strategies to climate induced water stretch and hazards in Greater Himalayan region by the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development and ourselves being a partner agency working on a case study in the Brahmaputra River Basin in India. These case studies were carried out over two years from 2008 to 2010, apart from thematic study and case study teams, international agencies like the International Institute of Environment and Development, the Stockholm Environment Institute, ISET Nepal, IWMI, and IDM India uh, were also involved in framing a policy framework for the project. 
The project had broadly uh, four objectives. It, start, it wanted to have an understanding of the implications of climate change on people's lives and livelihoods and try to understand how people respond. Also to assess and rank and have foster a better understanding of how people cope and adapt at local level. This which was done in the first phase of the project. In the second phase, there was an attempt to better understand the role of policies and institutions in local adaptation, as well as to examine the ways in which national policies and local governance arrangements can support or undermine, that's enable or disable people's adaptive capacity at community household as well as local, other local scales. Different groups adopted different research methods, but mainly it was confined to primary research tools like participatory rural appraisal, rapid rural appraisal, as well as secondary research, which was based on standard methods of using uh, a drawing from peer-reviewed as well as non-peer-reviewed sources, as well as gray literature. These were the four country studies that were taken up during the second phase about which I'm going to uh, speak more about in this uh, presentation on behalf of, and I'm also speaking on behalf of my co-author, Neera Pradhan from Isimut, as well as the entire adaptation team, which were engaged in different country studies. The learning from the phase one were important in making us understand that people everywhere do have a way to respond to climate-induced water hazards, but the characteristics of that response especially whether a response exists or not, whether a response is successful or not, is to a great extent determined by the policy context as well as the quality of governance. The local processes of coping and adaptation are very often influenced both positively or negatively. That means local adaptation can be enabled or disabled by the national level policies and actions if there is no integration between local and national scale. Good governance equipped with proper institutional mechanism and policies that address local needs and practices are the main key to ensure not only coping and adapting capacity, but also the resilience of the communities. This beautiful slide from our colleagues, Pakistan, shows the importance of having a policy. If you don't have a policy that guides you where to locate your settlements, and institutions like a school, you wrongly end up establishing your settlements in the wrong place, which is vulnerable to flash flood, debris flow, as well as landslide. The conceptual and analytical framework that was used in analyzing the results of the study highlights the interaction of different kind of institutes like public institutes, private institutes, as well as civil or civic institutes acting at different scales like national scale, sub-national scale, for example, in the case of India at the state level or maybe at the level of province in case of China with the local scales. If there is a broad interface between different planning processes happening at different scales, then it, it is observed to be supporting local adaptation at local scale, and if there is no interface, or if there is a, uh, not an adequately broad interface, it actually uh, doesn't support uh, uh, sufficiently local adaptation processes, or even in some cases, it increases people's vulnerability. Another way to understand the, in, the in interaction and importance of institutions and policies is to consider this inverted pyramid where the apex consists of the natural capital, comprising the primary natural systems like water, land, forestry, and energy, topped up by the social capital, comprising the man-made institutions like education, health, infrastructure, communication, finance, and transport, and superstructured with the political capital, which we can uh, term as governance and planning system. Now, these core systems interact with different kind of institutes at different levels to give the local people access to these resources as well as to maintain the quality of these resources. And these two things are very, very crucial to ensure adaptive capacity at local scale. Another 
qualitative, empirical, but beautiful uh, framework to understand whether a particular environment or situation is you know, conducive to growth of adaptive capacity is uh, it or not, is to consider these four elements which we in the project call the H3W framework, courtesy which, for which we owe our debt to Simon Anderson of International Center for uh, Environment and Development, which says that being healthy means well-being, having security as well as health. Being wealthy means not only having income, but also having asset holdings, both tangible and intangible, and to have enterprises. Being wise means having access to information and knowledge. And being well-governed means having equity equitable access to resources, as well as having enough scope for participation in decision-making as well as governance. If qualitatively this criteria has been, then the situation is supposed to be supporting local adaptation. Now picking up a few examples from the case study we carried out in the Brahmaputra Basin in northeastern India, where the observation was that lack of good governance of flood management, which was focused mainly on structural measures of flood management, basically embankments, was actually responsible for, in, in, for not only for you know, increasing people's vulnerability, but also for breaking people's hard-earned coping capacity for over a long period because of lack of proper maintenance of embankments and because of frequent breaching of embankments, people have been facing devastating floods that are created out of even a normal situation and people are made to uh, indulge in activities that actually lead to maladaptation as you can see in the uh, picture on the right corner where people are people end up living on the embankment because they don't have a suitable rehabilitation and resettlement package which is environmentally or culturally acceptable to them the live on embankments in order to survive or, or in order to visibly to reduce their vulnerability, but end up actually making them some more vulnerable by damaging the embankment as well as by uh, making it highly prone to the next wave of floods. Giving a few examples of wider development programs, the most prominent one in India is now called Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which by now uh, uh, in, in India is recognized as the most successful rural employment and rural uh, employment generation program, which is doing very well in flood affected areas uh, in Brahmaputra Basin by providing people 100 days guaranteed uh, job and cash income opportunity by indulging in activities that actually help in coping, coping with the flood situation. For example, these activities include repairing of embankments, construction of high-risk platforms, repairing of sluices, construction of rural roads and ponds. Another example of a development program that was initiated by Government of India with the state government was uh, the construction of a geotextile tube-based embankment for five kilometers that has saved the people from flood last year for the first time in two decades for last two decades, people have been suffering miserably for uh, being, you know, for uh, want of alternative livelihoods because agriculture has been totally destroyed in that region. But just getting protected for one year in 2010 made them regenerate their resources, made them regenerate their energy, and they were harvesting good crops. So this goes on to uh, show that you know adaptation doesn't need to be spoon-fed into their people. You just protect them from the disaster, ensure, their, ensure their, uh, 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 that they are no longer vulnerable to the source of disaster, and in most cases, they regenerate on their own strength. Other examples of international and national donor, donor agency interventions have indulged in activities basically in DR, not in adaptation, but are in short term also helping communities you know, to cope up with floods because they have been <coughs> getting safe drinking water, high-risk platforms, safe seed banks, relief materials, as well as medical help. But it remains to be seen whether these benefits, uh, uh, whether these results actually lead to adaptive capacity in the long run or not. I'll take two more minutes. Uh, another ex important example, how local institutions, especially cultural and social institutions, determine people's uh, cultural norms and values which actually uh, encourage people 
to uh, live in a certain kind of housing. For example, in the picture, you can see the missing tribal people live in the stilted houses. In the, it is, this is their traditional housing. But in the same vicinity, the people who do not belong to the same tribal group do not like to or, or do not live in the same kind of house. Uh, the, and the kind of house they use is more vulnerable uh, to flooding in spite of the stilted house being a good practice or even the best practice in that area it's difficult for the non-tribal communities to adopt because of their inbuilt cultural norms now policies especially in housing subsidies if they are not uh, sensitive to such culturally embedded uh, norms and values they cannot be successful in uh, enhancing people's adaptive capacity the most important uh, lacuna in the governance system of course was found by this analysis in the fact that the entire decision making system and implementation system of flood management projects is isolated from the participation of local communities, local civil society as well as local governance agencies. The important learnings from the second phase was that effectiveness of adaptation is actually determined by the interface whether there is an interface or not between formal and informal, public, private, and civic institutions that operate at different planning skills. And if there is no integration and coordination among sectoral and hierarchical institutions acting at different levels like national, subnational, sub and local, as well as uh, the same is true in case of policies, it actually hinders the achievement of resilience as a goal of any adaptation project or any development project for that matter. Now, conformity, coherence, collinearity, between formal and informal institutions and policies is a precondition for expansion, horizontal expansion as well as vertical upscaling. Based on this learning, we recommend that adaptation planning process should first of all ensure that there is a proper policies and institution and institutional arrangement in place. Next, it must ensure the participation of people at local level by different participatory methods to ensure local people's needs and understand uh, their requirements and learn from their local knowledge and practices and then create synergies between public and private as well as formal and informal adaptation interventions. Thirdly, local level good strategies and practices, there is no doubt that need to be expanded horizontally and scaled up through institutionalized linkages to national level policies. Thank you very much. This is our website. And if you want to know more about the respective case studies of all the countries, this can be downloaded. If you have more queries about the Brahmaputra Basin and the problem, I'm here to answer your queries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Partha, for that highly interesting um, account of what is happening in the Himalaya region. Um, we are moving back to Africa um, with Lawrence telling us a bit more about the Napa process in Uganda. Yeah, uh, I thought I would be very new, but I realized that I was already introduced in the plenary. So I begin from there. I'm going to give you a talk on uh, what influence do government structures have over the adaptive capacity of communities. So I work with the government. So when you come to Uganda, that's where you get me in the Ministry of Water and Environment. Uh, my presentation outline is just in front of you. I'll talk about what is NAPA, highlights on NAPA development process in Uganda, the Uganda NAPA priorities, challenges in implementing NAPAs in Uganda, and some way forward. Uh, as regards to what is NAPA, I just wish to remind ourselves that NAPA uh, was actually prepared by least developed countries after uh, a decision during com uh, seventh conference of parties to help the least uh, developed countries 
who are actually supposed, uh, supposed to be vulnerable and they have limited uh, means to address climate change issues. And then uh, some funding was allocated uh, by the Conference of Parties, that is the least developed country's fund, and its um, LDC was to access to a tune of 200,000 US dollars because there was a work program known as LDC work program which was developed. So in line with that, Uganda responded uh, by producing its NAPAs. But NAPAs were considered to be uh, actions to address immediate and urgent climate change vulnerability issues. Uh, but uh, in Ugandan case, we have a question to ask. How does Uganda NAPA support community-based adaptation? So it has been realized that much as NAPA was supposed to address uh, short, uh, urgent and immediate issues, it is actually a basis for long-term uh, community adaptive strategy and capacity building opportunities. It is also realized that existing structures are actually very important to make successful implementation of the NAPAs. Now I take you to Uganda. During the NAPA process, 13 districts were sampled based on about five ecosystems. That is the highland ecosystem, the lowland ecosystem, the semi-arid ecosystem, lake basin, and aquatic ecosystem. So uh, the colors are indicating the different ecosystems that we are considered. And the map shows the distribution of the selection. Then the Uganda Napa development process was based on the least developed countries expert group guidelines. Then the Uganda Poverty Eradication Action Plan. Uganda's vision, 2025, that time, which was to address um, poverty and then to make people prosperous and to make the nation harmonious and not forgetting the Millennium Development Goals. Then it was participatory and then the NAPAs were launched in 2007. This is an example of consultation in the uh, with the communities. Then the NAPA process came up with nine prioritized uh, intervention or project areas. This ranged from community tree growing to climate change uh, integration into development planning. And then the basic principle behind the implementation of NAPA in Uganda is actually the holistic, multi-sectoral, and multidisciplinary approach of programming. Then, in the case of Uganda, we are considering a concept of a NAPA community. And that community where NAPA is being implemented will have the following proposed indicators. Increase the household income levels, access to basic needs such as health, education, energy services and clean water, improved water harvesting technologies, increased agricultural production, good agricultural practices such as water and soil conservation inclusive, diversified livelihoods, increased demand for information especially weather and climate information for planning purposes and increased vegetation cover. Then this is the institutional framework uh, for Uganda. The Ministry of Water and Environment is the climate change focal institution for Uganda. Then it coordinates climate change activities within the country. This is followed by a project steering committee, including the climate change unit, which is a secretariat to the steering committee. 
then public institutions and other government ministries, CSOs and private sector. Then at the district level, we have the district implementation unit, which comprises key sectors of local governments, uh, CSOs and community representatives. Then at the community level, that is below the district uh, level, we have the involvement of the communities uh, themselves. Then what are the challenges of implementing NAPAs? We have uh, realized that since the NAPAs were launched in 2007, Uganda has never accessed the LDC fund. Then there is also limited implementation uh, in Uganda, mostly only national structures are in place. Then there is regional sensitization. Uh, here our regions uh, include some districts. So that is also another challenge. Then there is inadequate funding. Then what is the way forward that is being considered? The Ministry of Water Environment is uh, now taking on partnerships to pilot and roll out the NAPAs. This is in collaboration with organizations like uh, Royal Danis, then uh, the ACRA, the UN Joint Framework, which includes uh, all these UN uh, organizations, then civil societies and other possible organizations. There are also continued efforts to mainstream climate change adaptation into other sectoral plans and budgets at all levels. In the case of Uganda, only one ministry has tried to successfully integrate climate change into its sector investment plan. That is the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries. Then there is a directorate under the Ministry of Water and Environment responsible for water resources management. That has developed adaptation strategy for water resources management. And then we also need to engage in participation, especially in the climate change negotiations, where you bring on board the policymakers, including parliamentarians, especially from local level, regional level, uh, national level, even international level, so that they can come back and influence policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Um, before I summarize, I forgot to introduce myself. Um, I'm Eva Ludi from the Overseas Development Institute based in London, um, and also involved in the ACRA program um, hosting that session. Um, what we have heard now are four extremely interesting accounts of what is happening in different countries. Um, but what was common to all of them, I thought, was that they highlighted the need for holistic approaches that try to integrate across stakeholders, so different stakeholders from um, private sector, government, CBOs, NGOs, local farmers, fishermen, um, traders, so to bring together those stakeholders in a process aiming at enhancing adaptive capacity at local level. Also, they all highlighted the need for a multi-sectoral approach. So it doesn't help if we just try and focus on climate risks and how to mitigate those without looking at how to improve livelihoods through other means in the agricultural sector, through providing basic social services, etc. Thirdly, they were all highlighting the need for going across scales. It doesn't help just to focus at the local level, trying to address issues. There are higher level drivers that make communities vulnerable to climate hazards or variability or change. So I think all of these presentations highlighted those needs. And it sounds 
absolutely easy to just say, yes, let's do a holistic integrated approach. But when it comes to reality, it is more than difficult. And I'm sure you mainly being um, practitioners know exactly how difficult it is even trying to work across NGOs and governments to integrate approaches to try and do things jointly. But instead of sort of dwelling on those higher level um, critical questions that have been addressed in some of the sessions, what we also found in our small project and what question we have put to the, to the um, panelists and which I then would also like to put out to the, to the plenary is innovation is necessary. Climate change, climate hazards poses threats which in some cases are not known to neither the people who are affected directly by them nor by institutions that are meant to deal with them. So one of the key questions to us is how can we foster innovation at local level? What is necessary in terms of support? What is necessary in terms of institutional framework? What is necessary in terms of governance? So to come back these questions which we highlighted. I think given the, the time, um, we have started a bit late, I think we can also um, take a few more minutes um, to go over the time allocated. But I think what is really, really critical is this question on innovation. How can we foster innovation? We have touched in this session, in another session on, on institutions, on governance. So I would like to focus on that first bit on innovation and how can different programs, different interventions, whether it's NGO interventions, whether it's government policy, um, foster this kind of innovation at a local level. To do that, I would like to ask the panelists to, in one sentence, highlight what their project, what their intervention has specifically done to enhance, to foster innovation that allows communities to increase their adaptive capacity and then I would like to open the floor to comments from the plenary. So if, if I can just give the word to the panel starting from Partha going through one sentence what kind of support do you provide or have you um, done to enhance innovation at local capacity and also highlight what that innovation was. Hello. Well, in our specific case, it was not a development intervention, it was a research study. But we always uh, realize the importance of innovation and we actually emphasize communities to cross-learn within the greater area from each other because communities were actually indulging in fantastic activities which are not well known well to the policy makers as well as decision makers. So uh, building on local uh, uh, practices and learning from each other actually uh, makes a way for I mean, bringing in the innovation element in your projects. No, I will ask for yours. No, I won't. Hello? No, oh, hurry. Um, so, Tier Funds also does program work um, in communities, and I've been evaluating some of that as well. And um, we've trained our partners um, in, I don't know how many countries, maybe 13 countries in climate change risk assessment and environmental um, assessment too. And through that process, our partners have trained local field workers who are passing on the learning at community level. And science is being filtered down right to community level and communities themselves are um, showing the capacity and the interest to raise up on issues that affect their local environment but also their national um, policies on climate change mitigation um, as well as adaptation and I can't really believe this when I see it but it's true that's what's been going on and, um, and it's been very exciting so I, I think um, our question now is how to get accurate science out in a way that is consistent and, and avoids those Chinese whispers that we saw yesterday in one of the sessions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, in one sentence I think it's providing um, what we found is projects that provide the environment to enable people to innovate themselves are the, are the most successful, especially around access to markets. So. Um, 
as I said, where you uh, build roads uh, and people are able to get to the market or you somehow facilitate access to markets. Uh, forming groups, often when you form those groups, they will then be quick to identify uh, economic activities that they can undertake. So those seem to be the areas where the projects have created the conditions for spontaneous innovation. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of projects, a lot that projects can do to introduce new activities uh, full stop. Thank you. Um, uh, what we tried to do was when we went for regional sensitization in one of the areas, we engaged the media. They hosted us in one of the local radios, and then we gave our speeches, and telling them not to basically just wait for other people to come and help them, but try to work within their means. And then the, the, the media person was very, very happy and promised that he is going to repeat those statements and play for some time to encourage the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, a few examples where development interventions that are not geared directly towards addressing climate hazards or directly geared towards um, improving adaptation do help to enhance adaptive capacity. And I think that is one of the, of the key insights um, of, of our project. Um, and I'm quickly pulling that up in, you know, sort of in, in trying to, to identify what project interventions are already going up that do help to strengthen adaptive capacity. And that can be in addressing long-term resilience and it can also be in addressing short-term risks and vulnerability. So I think there are a lot of activities going on that already contribute to adaptive capacity that already enhance innovation at local level. Um, but it's now up to you either for questions or direct contributions to um, how to foster innovation in supporting adaptive capacity. So in the striped shirt and then for front row. Hi, thank you. Uh, Craig Bowman from Monash University. My, my question is primarily directed to Joe. Um, my, my ears perked up when you, when you mentioned cash for work because uh, I had a lot of exposure to cash for work in, in research that I did on the tsunami recovery in, in Aceh, where it got a very, very bad rap. I mean, everyone from, from staff of national ministries down to WAGs in the coffee shop, everyone said that it undermined self-sufficiency and destroyed our vaunted institutions of mutual self-help and whatnot. But, but our, um, our research indicated, in fact, that it was one of the most effective donor interventions of the entire tsunami recovery, tsunami, if you will, uh, with, with the least uh, amount of, of, of negative externalities compared to other, to livelihood projects or housing projects, or other infrastructure projects. Uh, now, it, can you please speak to the, the opportunities provided by cash for work programs um, when they are they're sort of uh, integral to a, a longer-term strategy rather than something that's just reactive to an emergency or, or, or situational. Um, the opportunities provided for uh, institution building, or, or to use your terminology, to, to engender uh, flexible and forward-thinking institutions and governance. Thank you. Okay, can we take a second question and then we answer and then we go on with further issues. Hi, this is a question, well, sort of a comment and question for Sarah. Um, we talk about holistic approach and we talk about multi-stakeholder and multi-sectoral. And in one of the presentations this morning, I, was, I think it was the UNDP, Jeff, where I think they were able to bring the president to one of the sites. And I just wanted to know, if, are there cases or have you found cases in your research where not just the Ministry of Environment is coming to observe CBA projects, but you're bringing, people have been able to bring Ministry of Home Affairs representatives or Ministry of Finance or, you know, to really start, or Ministry of Agriculture to start really sensitizing them to what's happening at the local level and kind of trying to help build that sort of um, awareness and, and, you know, more holistic approach sort of in, in overall development planning. Thank you very much. Um, Joe, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, I'm actually going to hand over to Kirsty, the Ethiopia coordinator who's, who's sitting just there. 
Sure. Thanks a lot for that question. I think it, um, it's something that we're thinking about a lot in Ethiopia. Uh, the Productive Safety Net program is a huge uh, multi-year program supporting many millions of chronically food insecure people um, and mobilizing a tremendous uh, amount of uh, community energy in public works programs. And I think there are a number of opportunities for this program to uh, foster adaptive capacity and, as you mentioned, to uh, strengthen uh, institutions at different levels, particularly because uh, of the level of community involvement that is, uh, the, the, the structure of the program provides for a high level of community involvement in selecting and identifying the types of public works projects that, are, uh, uh, that, that the community labor is used to support. So if, that, if those community level task forces are managed uh, effectively, that means that uh, public works can be used to really tackle some of the most pressing priorities at uh, community level. Uh, and I think the, the learning from the, there are task forces are also at district and regional level sort of overseeing and providing technical support to the public works program, which um, is also very important. It's not, not without its, its challenges and risks. Um, I say that there are examples of where these community task forces are extremely well managed and, and provide that, that institutional strengthening, but there are also other examples where that has been very difficult to create and that the culture of uh, making uh, cash and food transfers and its association with the sort of humanitarian response has meant that the, for some officials the program is more about simply getting the food out there than really engaging in these kind of uh, processes and I think also uh, lack of technical expertise to ensure that the labor is really used for um, projects that are likely to have significant and sustainable impact is also major challenges that are being addressed in the, in the next um, stage of the program. And as Joe mentioned, it's, the, the transfers themselves are great for helping people to uh, survive and to, to avoid losing their assets, but to engender the kind of transformation that they need to really adapt to, to these changes more efforts are needed and the government is uh, now piloting a household asset building program that is looking much more at market access, access to financial services alongside the safety net program to try and uh, engender that kind of transformation. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah, would you want to answer the second question? Okay, um, I don't think I can answer the second question, sorry. Um, I didn't come across that, apart from I'm not sure about Nepal. I'm trying to rack my brains whether ministers actually were part of the transect group. And there are lots of people that were involved in that process at the conference, like Raju and people from Liebert. So they, I don't know if they're in the room, but maybe they could answer. And I don't know what's happened in Uganda, for instance. Did ministers go into the community there as part of developing the NAPA? Um, uh, in the preparation of NAPAs, the ministers did not go uh, to the communities. But what happened was uh, a task force was formed, but they uh, nominated uh, technical officers from the various ministries like health, agriculture, the academia, then this uh, grouped to form a team and they went to the communities. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, there are some more hands up. Um, that lady in the back, yeah, exactly, waving. Hi, my name is uh, Paula. I'm working with the Strengthening Climate Resilience Program with IDS Plan and Christian Aid. And uh, my question is also for Sarah and the uh, colleague from ECMOD and the persons who commented on integration. Because I'm currently working on m and &E systems that can evaluate the quality of integration processes. And in most of the uh, presentations, when talking about the challenges and recommendations, all of them were directed to uh, local institutions or governments that I would agree that that's uh, extremely important. But also the challenge there is that that's a political arena and it's a long-term uh, change that needs to be pursued. But when we start talking about recommendations, I don't know if 
in the short term, maybe we need to build a case for organizations, uh, including civil societies and NGOs, to uh, uptake integration processes themselves. Because as Salim was pointed out, uh, pointed out the other day, uh, governments don't lead, they follow. So we need the civil society and NGOs and community-based organizations to start looking at integrations because even themselves are highly fragmented. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure what the question was. Yeah, well, I wanted to ask if, if you would agree that that should be a recommendation for short term. Oh uh, yeah, I think that would be a great idea. I mean, I, at Tier Funds we're taking the 11 building blocks from um, the report and trying to turn them on ourselves. And, and it's challenging some things we're strong on and some things we aren't. But I think um, any organization should think about having high level leadership and cross sectoral work on adaptation and obviously participatory processes. Thank you. Um, in sort of in view of the advanced time and uh, probably sort of the grumbling stomachs of a number of participants, um, I'm taking one more question and then otherwise please um, address issues and questions directly to the speakers. Yes, please. Hi, I'm just uh, interested from any of the panel members, um, what are some of the uh, gender dimensions of the work? It's been sort of alluded to in some of the presentations, but uh, particularly around the issues of innovation and entitlement, uh, what is the space that's been created specifically for women and, and women's innovation and uh, even things like women's empowerment, is that seen as an approach that can help the adaptive capacity of communities? Thanks a lot, I think, great question. Um, something that hasn't directly been addressed, but um, I don't know who would want to take a lead, Jo? Um, I mean, I can very briefly speak to that. I mean, I think it goes without saying that gender is a, a really important area. You know, the tasks that women undertake, certainly in the three Accra countries, um, are all ones that are very vulnerable to climate change and natural resource degradation, you know, so very basic things like the number of hours they walk to get firewood, water, um, you know, uh, a lot of them do a lot of the agricultural work, um, so it's very important. Uh, in my presentation, I briefly mentioned that um, what we're finding is where uh, projects are building up assets but ignoring the power relations or not taking the time to understand the informal institutions, um, then you're ending up with problems. So the example I gave was a cash transfer to men in towns, uh, and no slur on any of the men who live in towns in this audience, but uh, it meant, you know, it actually is a little bit more effective if you transfer uh, to the women, they're more likely to spend it on their family. Um, so uh, there, there are issues where you don't pay attention to the the gender sort of the, or the power relations within the community, whether that's about gender or, or more general power. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's what I'd, I hope that answers your question. It is important. We, we do still find it quite difficult to, um, to, to pull that out. Um, you know, gender is still something that has been mainstreamed in many projects to, to oblivion. And so um, trying to pull out the gender impacts uh, is something we're really uh, trying to do through separate focus group discussions and different methodologies, but it is challenging. Thank you very much. Any other? Yes, please, Lawrence. Yeah, in the case of uh, Uganda Napa, uh, actually, for uh, history, historical evidence of climate change, both elderly men and women uh, were were con consulted and then also a group of youth was also consulted uh, to extend the scope so a gender dimension was really looked at thank you very much um, i think with that i would like to close that session first by asking everyone to give the presenters a good clap for their excellent presentations. Um, again, as we mentioned, we have been asked to write a book chapter, so also if other people do have experiences and examples on how 